talking today with Doug DeGroff from Diversified Dairy Solutions. Welcome to the program. Yeah, thanks for having me, Walt. Doug, tell me a little bit about your business and uh, what you do. I have a nutritional and consulting business here in the Central Valley of California. Me and another gentleman uh, work with about 30 herds up and down the state. We go as far south as Chino and go to about Fresno. We provide nutritional and consulting services to uh, those dairies and calf ranches and also some uh, heifer ranches as well. Earlier this year at World Ag Expo, You presented a presentation about how to reduce feed shrink and wanted to have you share with our digital viewers today some of the principles that you taught. Define shrink. This is one of many shrink definitions that I came across, and it can simply be defined as a percent of feed on a farm that is not accounted for by the animals for which it was intended. Pretty much saying that, you know, feed that doesn't end up in the cow's mouth that it was intended to is also feed shrink. There's a lot of dairy producers who may feel that, well, the feed was actually fed, so it wasn't a complete loss. Well, I'm under the opinion of that animal didn't need it. It was an excess. So it's that kind of shrink, and it's also the shrink that it leaves the dairy in so many, many other ways. Uh, I don't need to tell anybody who's involved in the dairy business just how uh, expensive feed is these days. Feed shrink is caused by many, many factors, and these are just a list of the ones that I came up with, and there's certainly probably more that I haven't identified. Which of these factors do you see most frequently on commercial dairies? I would say silage, spoilage is a big one on commercial dairies. The feed bunk management, which leads right into managing of the push-out, is another big factor. Those are ones that jump right out at me. From Dennis Dugan, over a 60-day period, they measured the following shrink. Before I go down through that list, what they actually did is, at the beginning of the month, they weighed what was in the commodity bay. So they had an accurate count of what was there. They had an accurate count of the delivery trucks that came over the scale that month. And then they matched that with their feed software program, FeedWatch, to see what did their feed system say they fed, and then what was the feed that disappeared on the dairy. And the mill run was... A uh, 16% shrink, distiller's grains, a 9% shrink, soy plus, 9% shrink, alfalfa hay at 7 uh, finally corn solid at 16%. So some pretty big numbers. So a 1-1,000 cow dairy is going to spend approximately $3.5 million to feed its cows, its dry cows, and its heifers, not including the baby calves. If you were to move down and if that dairy had 5% shrink, that would be $175,000 a year. At 8%, you're looking at $280,000, 10%, $350,000. If it was way up there at 12%, it would be $420,000 in shrink. And that bottom number, that 244, round up again, $245,000 is price of non-compliance. And that is the difference between 12% shrink and 5% shrink on this one 1,000 cow dairy. I'm saying that uh, I think uh, the commercial dairy, with a lot of effort and a lot of management, can get down to that 5% shrink. And the dairies that aren't putting a lot of time, money, or energy into managing their their commodities or their shrink are probably up in that 12% range. And again, this is just a one 1,000 cow dairy I want to. I want to reemphasize that. So if you got a two or three or four thousand cow dairy, these numbers start adding up really fast. You've got some uh, visual examples to show us real life things you've been able to capture. Share with us some of those things that are do not do's. Okay, for sure. So the first I'll start off with a definitely do, and that is if you do not have an arm farm scale that is uh, taking into account. The uh, feed that is coming onto your dairy, then that, I think this is a must. This is a, a quote from a dairy producer that I work with here in Tulare, owners of Lemster Cattle Company, David and Matcha Lemstra. Uh, I'll just read their quote. We were invoiced for seven loads of feed from five different suppliers that were not delivered to our dairy in December of 2011. Just going to reiterate that point is, so they had five different suppliers. It wasn't one supplier. It was five different suppliers who invoiced them for seven loads of feed that they were never delivered. So uh, obviously lots of breakdown there, but had they not been matching up weight uh, tickets to their invoices, that might not have been caught. And certainly a dairy who didn't have a scale and weren't taking into account deliveries, um, there's no way of viewing that this feed was or was not delivered. To me, this is a huge must. If you do not have an on-farm scale, to me, it, you need to get it in. Again, if you're not measuring it, there's no way you can monitor it. 
And then moving on, I've, I've got countless pictures here of, of ingredients. Uh, this particular one is uh, corn and distiller's grains. So it's a hybrid. I'm not sure what happened here, but this is a way this corn was delivered on the dairies. I don't know what they, how they were built. Were they built for corn? Were they built for distillers? And then, more importantly, how is it going to be uh, fed? Moving to the next photo, wind. That is a horrible enemy to shrink. As you can see, this mineral, this was actually mineral that was, was blown away. Here's a picture of some ingredients. This is distiller's grain that was uh, blown by some wind. Almost looks like a golden snowdrift there. Birds are, are a horrible thing on dairies, not only because of diseases they can carry, but also they are a very expensive pet. As you can see, this, this picture, these are all blackbirds at a particular dairy that I work with. Moving on to the next picture, this is a, a picture depicting these cows tossing feed. And, and if you look closely, you can see about five or six cows there that have feed on their backs. Of course, that ends up in the litter alley uh, rather than staying in the manger so it can be consumed. Next picture is a well-managed solid face. It's a mechanically shaven face, and boy, they're doing a great job of pitching off the mold. Look at all that feed that was purchased that is uh, going to the compost pile, uh, being used as fertilizer. It is now showing with the cement ends and the dirt and manure combination start. They clean out the majors on this dairy over the, every other day, and, and they push it along the dirt and the manure and whatever else is there in the driveway, and they push it up that pile in the distance, and, and they try to reclaim as much as they can. As, as you can see, they have leave a lot behind. The next picture is depicting some whole cotton seed at 160 degrees. I'll bring your attention to the date in the lower right. And this picture was taken on June 16th of 2010, so it did not get rain down here in California. We don't get we don't get any rain here in the Central Valley, so somehow, some way, uh, the seed had a little bit of moisture in it. And all the nutrients were cooked out of it, and if you were to break these holes open, you would actually see the, the cotton seed itself and as black as tar in there. All the nutrients were cooked right up. Next photo is just, I look at this, uh, the feed area is a kitchen. Just like chefs and people who, who cook in kitchen, they need to keep their kitchen clean. And this is a prime example of not having a very clean kitchen. Some wind were to come, some rain were to come. This feed that's all outside the commodity bay is going to end up in the definition of shrink. And here's just another example of a bunch of feed outside a commodity storage area that is being used to drive on. If you look in the lower left-hand corner, that's a raised cement edge. My point is here that we need to have a smooth surface in our commodity area so that we don't have uh, little bumps that dump feed all over the place and then end up just tracking it from one end of the dairy to the other. Next photograph is well-designed but poorly managed commodity barn. Commodity barn is to keep commodities inside the barn, out of weather, out of getting tracked on tires, and here's some $400 cotton seed that is sitting outside just waiting for a rainstorm. And if you look in the lower left again, you can see some of that's just on the dirt, and it's going to get tracked away or down a squirrel hole, uh, but it's not going to end up in the, in the mouth of a cow. So we've all heard of uh, blacktop, this some white top. What this is is a driveway, and if you look real closely, that's a whole cotton seed. Either the truck driver had his gate open or didn't finish fully unloading the, the load, but pretty expensive shrink there. This is a picture showing some distiller's grains getting mixed in with the dirt outside of a commodity storage area. The next photo is the quality of the photo isn't the best, but the, the point can be made. On, on the left, that's uh, canola at $340 a ton, and on the right is soybean meal at $440 some odd dollars a ton. And uh, we're going to commingle in the ingredients and let the feeder figure out exactly how, uh, how to feed it. This is a photograph that just pains me to see. There's there's no reason that feed should ever be put up this way. This is some um, haylage that was put up a little over a year ago that, uh, as you can see, the dry matter was all wrong, and uh, we weren't able to actually feed this feed. It, it made it down over to the compost pile. Moving on, this is a pile of corn silage that was put up incredibly too wet. You look in the lower right-hand corner again, the date uh, depicting September the, the 20th, and the Central Valley, California, we we don't see uh, rain in September, uh, so this is not water. This is uh, insulage running off a freshly harvested corn silage pile. If producers want to get serious about controlling shrink, what types of systems will they need to consider? So this picture is very expensive investment in a feed management system. This is where all the feed is, all the grains are contained in bins or actually almost in a small uh, grain mill setting. As you can see in the background, that is the silage pile. This is a, this is actually a picture from Mexico, not here in the United States, but here in Mexico, who uh, recognized trying to control you know, the main cost on their dairy, um, and that is feed. The next picture, this is from Dugan's Dairy in Arizona. Uh, a couple stationary boxes, 
They've got the mineral tanks in the back where everything is contained. One other picture here is showing the back side of that. Again, trying to contain everything, uh, keep it out of the way of wind, birds, and any kind of problems there. So, And then this next picture is a major investment that was made on a dairy in the Midwest. See all those tanks, all those augers, but notice the very little bit of feed that is actually uh, on the yard. You can see a little bit of feed in that lower left-hand corner. Pretty much everywhere else, that feed is all contained in those in those dents. This last picture is just some blocks. You know, there's a picture of a dairy I work with here in California. That these very inexpensive blocks can be used not only in, under roof um, to keep ingredients separate, but they can also be used out in the feed yard to keep from pushing uh, feed around. My take-home message is many factors result in feed waste and of shrink, and shrink may represent 5 to 15 percent of the total feed cost. Wet and expensive ingredients represent the greatest concern. Low milk prices and high feed prices increase the importance of reducing shrink, so the, the period of which we're in right now needs to be a top priority on many dairies across the country. And uh, the last point I'd like to make is significantly lower feed shrink is an economic opportunity for nearly all dairies. Thanks for your attention, and I appreciate the opportunity, Paul. Thanks for sharing these important points that dairy producers can use to minimize shrink.